calling uh, this info briefing to order. Aloha mai kako. I am Mike Gabbard, Chair of the Senate Agriculture Environment Committee, and I hope you and your Ohana are well and keeping safe. Uh, a couple of brief announcements before we begin the presentations. Uh, because the building is still currently closed to the public, this info briefing will be streamed live online on the Senate YouTube channel. It's available via the hearing notice. Uh, and for all of you presenters participating remotely, please keep your mic on mute when you're not actively speaking. Um, please don't unmute your mic or speak until you're called on. And also check your chat panel periodically. So today's joint informational briefing is being co-chaired by the Senate uh, AEN Committee and Waterland Committees and the House Energy and Environmental Protection, Agriculture and Water and Land Committees. Uh, the briefing will provide an update on the state's efforts to address threats posed by invasive species, as well as the state's interagency biosecurity plan in place to minimize these threats. Um, so first I'd like to introduce the AEN members uh, who are here on Zoom, myself, and let me see who else is here. Uh, just so Senator Rhodes is here, and I'm uh, hopeful that uh, Senator Ocasio and Senator Favela, and who am I not thinking about right here? <laughs> oh, Vice Chair, Senator Nishar will be joining us later. Um, and I'll turn it over the mic now to the other co-chairs uh, to introduce their members, starting with Waterland Chair, Senator Inouye. Thank you, uh, Chair Gabbard. I'm not sure who is here. Um, I can't see them, all of them, on view. Uh, but I did hear you say that Senator Favela is on your committee as well. Uh, he is on mine, so I assume he's on there. I'm not sure if Senator, uh, my Vice Chair, Senator Agaran, uh, will be on, but he normally gets on. So we'll, we'll, we'll play by ear. As okay. of now, uh, we're having said that. Thank you. Thank you, Sen. Uh, next, Rep. Lowen. Uh, aloha. Um, I'm Nicole Lowen, Chair of the House Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection. Um, I don't see, uh, I mean, Chair Hashem uh, is also, we're also on each other's committees. But other than that, a lot of our uh, members are currently in finance or CPC hearings that are concurrent to this. So. Uh, maybe some of them will join us later if they're able, but um, we'll be sure to share all this important information with them. Thank you, Rep. Lohan. Rep. Hashem. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Mark Hashem. I see, I also see Representative Bronco on there, and I think that's the only other member that we probably miss. And I'll turn it over, turn it back to you. All right, Rep. Tarnas. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the Water and Land Committee in the House, um, I'm grateful that everyone is here. Uh, other members are at other hearings right now. Uh, and so um, I'll be uh, carrying this information and provide it to them. And I appreciate everyone uh, being here. Back to you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Rep. Tarnas. Okay, so uh, a few opening remarks. I think it's, it's interesting that invasive species are one of the few issues that multiple state agencies work together to address. You know, many times I've noticed departments, they get stuck in their silos and they aren't really aware of what other agencies are doing. But the reality is invasive species impact agriculture, human health, transportation, natural and cultural resources, tourism, you know, basically our way of life here in the islands. So this info briefing will showcase the continuing efforts of our state agencies and partners to implement the goals and actions outlined in the Hawaii Interagency Biosecurity Plan. Uh, this year actually marks the halfway point since the plan's launch in 2017. So today we will be hearing from a dedicated staff who are working to implement the 147 action items. <laughs> That's right, 147 action items in the biosecurity plan and their department's role in improving biosecurity for Hawaii. So first off, we have Chelsea Arnott with the Hawaii Invasive Species Council to provide us with an update on the Hawaii Interagency Biosecurity Plan. Chelsea? Great, thank you so much, Chair Gabbard. Um, and aloha, chairs, vice chairs, and members of all the committees. Um, thank you for that introduction, it was great. I'm going to share my screen right now. So just give me a second to get that going. Um, and just, 
for logistics, I'll be sharing my screen for all the presenters today, just to make it a little easier for the transition as we go forward. Um, so I just really wanna thank you all for participating in this informational briefing. Um, I know the schedules are incredibly busy, so I, I really appreciate you all taking the time out um, to hear about what our agencies, our partners are doing, working together with invasive species. Um, and that was such a great introduction because I agree, this informational briefing is really unique compared to other informational briefings because we have multiple departments represented here today, as well as some of our partners that are working on the prevention and management of invasive species. And invasive species, I mean, they have no jurisdictions, they have no boundaries, they impact every sector. And that's really why the Hawaii Invasive Species Council, which I'm a planner for, was established back in 2003. The purpose of the council is to provide policy level direction, coordination, and planning amongst the state departments for the prevention, control, and eradication of harmful invasive species. Um, probably most of you are familiar with the council, but I just want to run through who we are um, and put some faces to the actions that we're doing here. So our council members include that are voting representatives um, from the departments of transportation, business and economic development and tourism, health, the University of Hawaii, and the departments of agriculture and land and natural resources, both serve as co-chairs to the council. We also have our non-voting legislative members that you see, and you know, there's a few folks in the room today. Um, and then we have our HIST program support staff. Um, and so this, these staff oversee some of our programs like the Ports of Entry Biosecurity Program that was formerly known as Mamalo Poi Poi, uh, the 643pest.org, our pest reporting hotline, um, the Hawaii Pacific Weed Risk Assessment. And since we're multi-agency, we also oversee um, the tracking and implementation of the Hawaii Interagency Biosecurity Plan that Chair Gabbard mentioned earlier. Um, Again, because of the multi-agency nature of the council, um, we really help to kind of coordinate the efforts of, you know, how are we doing with implementing this plan? Um, but what you're gonna hear from today are the folks that are actually doing the impl implementation of <laughs> what Chair Gabbard said, those 147 action items. So these folks are really the ones that are putting in the work um, to make a more biosecure Hawaii. And just a few other things that we do. Um, we also are responsible for the dispersal of state funding that supports projects and programs across Hawaii that are critical to managing invasive species. Um, you can see in some photos here of the Island Invasive Species Committee. Um, they do really critical work at controlling incipient invasive species like little fire ants on Maui, um, eradicating albizia trees on Molokai, and also supporting um, other research, prevention and control and outreach projects. But the need continues to grow and our current funding only supports a portion of these projects and programs that are so critical to biosecurity in Hawaii. Um, and this graph just shows um, we've had a steady increase in the green bars for our state appropriation, but you can see the need of our programs and projects just continue to grow. And that brings us over to the Hawaii Interagency Biosecurity Plan. Like I mentioned earlier, um, I'm only gonna just provide a real brief update on the biosecurity plan, um, but then I'm gonna turn it over to our partners to talk a little bit more about what they're doing. And so the Biosecurity plan was launched by Department of Agriculture in 2017. It outlines a 10-year shared path forward to improving biosecurity in Hawaii. As mentioned before, the, there's 147 action items identified in the plan that are key to addressing gaps at the areas of the pre-border, border, and post-border. Since its launch, we've begun implementation on 65% of the actions 
Um, but when you break that down, only a small portion of those have been or can be considered completed so far. A lot of those are ongoing, ongoing in perpetuity. They don't really have any end. And there's still a lot of progress and a lot of work to be done. We've made really great strides, but there's still a lot to be done. And I just want you to keep in mind that invasive species, once they're established, they have high cost and damages and management. These are just a, probably a few familiar faces, um, brown tree snake, little fire ants, myconia, and then newer, newer introductions, Rapidohia death and coconut rhinoceros beetle that we don't really know the cost of yet. And then just the comparison of those with one year of implementation of the biosecurity plan compared to the cost of any of these species becoming established. And I will leave it at that and pass it over to our partners at Hawaii Department of Agriculture. We have Helmut Rog and Raquel Wong. I will just pull up their presentation. All right. Well, thank you, chairs, vice chairs, and members of the committees. Thank you for the opportunity to present the accomplishments of our department as partner in the biosecurity program. We have two divisions involved in protecting Hawaii from invasive species. I'm Helmut Rock, administrator of the plant industry division with the department that consists of the plant quarantine branch, the plant pest control branch, and the pesticides branch. The second division is our animal industry division and Dr. Wong will report out following my presentation. Next slide, please. The mission of our division is to protect Hawaii's unique natural resources and agriculture economy from invasive species. How do we accomplish this mission? Next slide, please. Our three prong approach is focusing on prevention Preventing the invasive pests from coming to Hawaii in the first place is more economical than waiting until it is established. Being proactive is the preferred approach over reactive mode. Part of our preventive measures include enforcing quarantine regulations based on pest risk assessments. However, since not everyone stops at the stop sign, we use our second line of defense, our detection system, to early detect invasive species so we can rapidly respond and eradicate the incipient population before it becomes established and spread to other sites and islands. If we are, despite of all our proactive approaches, not successful in keeping an invasive species out, we implement management programs, including our biological control. Next slide, please. What are some of our accomplishments? As part of our prevention approach, we implemented an interim rule for the coffee leaf rust disease, and we are currently finalizing an interim rule to slow the spread of the coconut rhinoceros beetle on Oahu. We are also working on a quarantine rule to regulate the importation of firewood to Hawaii, minimizing the risk of accidentally importing exotic wood boring pests. Last year, our plant quarantine branch launched a new database to assist in our inspection efforts. Kupono is the new database that facilitates the work of our inspectors and is also more user-friendly for our customers than the old system. However, despite all of our efforts, we continue detecting new exotic species. On average, every year we have reported 20 new species from new state to new US records. There are indications that some of these new species are using a new pathway that I will mention later on. Our detection approach is to collaboratively implement a detection survey program for important invasives with our state and federal partners. For several established invasive pests, we continue our management projects. We have added additional funding to the coffee berry bore and the coffee leaf rust subsidy program to offset the additional cost to protect coffee from coffee berry borer and now coffee leaf rust. We are also closely working with our coffee industry, researchers from UH, ARS, and HARC 
and our regulatory sister agency, AFIS PPQ, to find a safe and efficient way to import clean, resistant coffee varieties from overseas through a clean plant network approach to Hawaii. We are also working with our industry and stakeholders to reduce the spread of the coconut rhinoceros beetle, as you just heard, using compliance agreements, mitigating the risk of spread through green waste. We're about to execute an additional contract with UH researchers on the management of the two-line spittlebug and offer a subsidy program to assist with the additional cost of fighting this new pasture pest. Next slide, please. As part of the biosecurity plan, our agency is fulfilling its statutory role in protecting Hawaii from invasive species. We are in the process of refilling some of the vacancies in our branches, hiring for positions identified in the biosecurity plan, and identifying new personnel needs based on funding reality. For our pre-border activities, we are focusing on generating risk analysis assessments, how invasives get here, which ones, and on what pathway. Our planned quarantine brand successfully switched to a new database system that assists in prioritizing our inspection efforts and obtaining important cargo data for improving our inspection success. Next slide, please. Upon arrival of cargo and passengers, our qualified PQ inspectors inspect risk material at our airports and maritime ports. In addition, we deploy specific traps for known invaders in coordination and collaborations with our partners to implement our EDRR approach, early detection, rapid response. We want to prevent invasive species from entering our state before they become established. As mentioned, it is more economical to prevent invasive species from entering Hawaii than reacting to them once they are established. Next slide, please. However, some pests may evade our control because we don't have specific lures or traps to early detect them, and they do become established. Our specialists from plant quarantine and plant, cost, plant pest control branches try to implement eradication efforts for incipient populations, which we may be still able to eradicate, such as the koki, frog, and the little fire ant populations on some islands. Once the pest is well established or we don't have good eradication tools available, we develop management options in coordination with our partners. A successful long-term management option is biological control. And Hawaii is one of the top leaders in biocontrol programs in the country. Next slide, please. Our challenges obviously are multiple. We are constantly reviewing critical positions based on today's needs and funding limitations. We are working on funding support of adequate facilities, in particular for our biocontrol facility, and we are dealing with new pathways of invasive pests. Today, you can purchase anything from anywhere online and get it shipped to your home overnight. And in addition, because of the COVID pandemic, we are experiencing funding limitations for adequate pest response, which I will show you in the next slides. However, these challenges offer us an opportunity to continuously review our pest response and eradication approach. Next slide, please. So Koki is one of these examples. We've been responding to various Koki populations on Oahu for over 10 years. We are able to hold our grounds, but it comes with a steep cost. And my division does not have a line item to adequately deal with the Koki invasion. So we have to find alternative approaches. Currently, we are bringing together all of our partners with invasive species experience to work on an adequate response to the Koki population here in Waimanalo. Slide, next slide, please. The other example of long-term project is our response to the little fire ant. Over the last 10 years or so, we have spent a significant amount of resources on our LFA response, but have difficulties making a dent in the eradication. Our department experts and others, including obviously our Hawaii and lab, continue their efforts to slow the spread, 
but we are faced with financial limitations. However, we still believe that working with our experts and adequate funding, we can continue holding the spread. Last slide, please. In summary, it takes all of us to protect Hawaii. Thank you. And in continuation, Dr. Wong will briefly present our animal industry's role in the biosecurity program. Dr. Wong. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity for allowing us to share briefly about what animal industry does and how we are fulfilling our mission. All right. Um, Chelsea, I am not able to see my screen. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, all right. So the first slide I wanted to present was how um, our division features in with the plant industry division. And as you can see here, um, we do many things that complement the plant industry division. And we work with them because the plant quarantine branch, particularly, they are the gatekeepers for with their established list of prohibited and restricted species. And what animal industry does is set the criteria or the conditions for the animal commodities that are moving across our borders. The challenge is trying to do that at the speed of commerce. Next slide, please. All right. So our mission is to safeguard against animal diseases and pests that could impact human as well as human health as well as commerce. And we do that under the concept of One Health, which is a, which is a recognized concept in, among our public health partners because it's no, it look, examines the interaction between human health, animal health, and the environment. Next slide, please. So animal history division, animal industry division has a long history of performing biosecurity tasks to support that mission. Uh, routinely, animals that are coming into our state are required to be identified in a unique manner. They are tested for particular diseases that we are concerned about. And then we are also identifying who the owners are and where their destination is. At the border, we are reviewing those documents, verifying their identity, identity, as well as ensuring that they're not showing any signs of clinical disease. And actually that doesn't end our response. So after they arrive, some species um, are required to be isolated from the resident animals that might be on the farm. In addition, they might also be subject to post arrival testing, which continues to ensure that they do not carry any diseases that have a longer incubation period. We also increase the awareness uh, continuously with our veterinary partners in practice by engaging them and doing outreach to us to make sure that they recognize signs of disease and will alert our office. And that in conjunction with our federal partners, USDA, APHIS, to recognize diseases that might impact commerce as well as public health. Next slide, please. So emerging the threat, uh, disease threat, and diseases that are foreign to the United States um, are something that we have great concern about. Many times the avian influenza virus can severely affect poultry. And that is something that they are exposed to when migratory birds, which are asymptomatic for the virus, um, may come into contact with these poultry. And that can be very devastating for poultry operations. In recent years, African swine fever, which is a fatal disease in swine species only, has risen in Asia. And given Hawaii's close relationship with, with Asia, both culturally as well as in proximity, there is concern that this virus may make its way into the US. The virus itself is actually very efficient. It can move not just on sick animals, it can also move on um, meat products as well as feed stuff. So we, along with our federal partners, we make sure to watch for any signs and investigate occurrences of disease. And finally, um, exotic ticks, that's the other one that we worry about. Hawaii is blessed to only have two types of tick species, the brown dog tick and the spinous ear tick. Um, and with ticks on the US mainland, they are moving westward and northward. And so they bring diseases with them, the most probably visible one is the Lyme disease in the deer tick. And 
by making sure that we're checking the dogs and horses, which are species known to carry ticks, we want to ensure that we keep the tick population here as it is. Okay, now we're on the next slide. So, um, of course, along with the biosecurity plan, we are looking to get better at our jobs. And with that, uh, as far as the interagency biosecurity plan, we're hoping to date um, safe, secure facilities so we can continue to do our work as well as continuing to develop a workforce of skilled personnel that can recognize diseases or detect diseases. And of course, access to resources when response is necessary and corrective action is necessary. Final slide. Oops, whoop, that was it. <laughs> and there's the final slide. So again, thank you so much committee members for taking this opportunity to listen to the information um, I've had to share. And myself, as well as our division administrator, Dr. Isaac Mayero, who's also with us today, uh, will be available for questions. Yeah, mahalo. Um, we are gonna move over to Department of Land and Natural Resources. We have Emma Ewan and Kim Fuller. Um, let me get this set up. Hello, hi everyone. Um, Emma Ewan with Division of Forestry and Wildlife. I'm gonna just jump in really quickly because I think a lot of you are familiar with our 30, um, 2030 goal to protect 30% of our watershed forest by 2030, which is mainly to keep invasive hooved animals like pigs, sheep, deer, and goats out of our forests. Next slide. Um, we're asking for another $4 million in watershed CIP funding this year. That would be in addition to the existing $4 million appropriated for fiscal year 23. And um, you might wonder, where is that going? We're really going to be focusing on two main um, priorities. Next slide. The first one is um, Maui, Molokai, really trying to keep these um, exploding po um, populations of axis deer from really infiltrating these mountain areas and basically building these circular fences around the tops of the mountains where the forest remains to protect them from this really damaging pest. Um, next slide. And oh, and then, then the other real big focus of this additional funding would be for Hawaii Island. Um, the rapid ohia death crisis that has killed over a million trees um, is shown to be really um, able to be uh, mitigated through um, removing hooved animals. And you can see this is a picture of an uh, uh, area in Kahuku on the south side of Hawaii Island where that strip in the right hand side is unfenced. You can see so much more um, mortality trees than the areas in um, the left side that are fenced and protected from hooked animals. So it's just night and day. This is a really incredible tool to keep trees from being um, uh, wounded and have that infection site. Next slide. We, um, we've seen between two to 69 times higher infection rates in areas that are unfenced versus right next door where they're um, been protected. So this is just an amazing solution that's at our fingertips to protect these forests from rapid ohia death. Next slide. Um, you can just see right now, only 6% of Hawaii Island is actually ungulate free and fenced. And so we're really trying to increase that percentage. Um, uh, we want to quickly get rid of the, the hooved animals within recently um, constructed fenced areas. And that's actually something, next slide. Um, that we're going to be helping, uh, we'd be doing with HB 1769, which is a um, bill to appropriate additional funding for um, that hooved animal removal, as well as other really important things, monitoring surveys, that sort of thing for rapid ohia death um, response. Next slide. And just to remind you that, you know, this, the funding that's provided for CIP has been really magnified because it enables us to attract um, non-state funding. And we've been able to get $49 million in non-state funding from this watershed appropriations in the past 10 years. Next slide. And that's really helping our um, crews out there on all the islands being you know, in the mud, camping, um, working really hard in these very difficult conditions, being able to give back to the land that they really love and want to protect. So we're really hoping to keep this great work going. Next slide. Just really jumping into a bunch of other invasive species um, milestones we wanted to report. This past year, we're so excited to um, 
declare Lehua Island off Kauai rat free. This has been decades in the making and now um, there is a CIP request to put in some a little bit of infrastructure to do the next phase of restoration. Next slide. Another amazing milestone was the um, first Uwa'u, the Hawaiian petrel nest discovered on Mount Akea in about 70 years. Unfortunately, right as we discovered that, we also found a um, cat prowling around the burrow. So we really want to attract a safe place where this bird can have another population. Um, and so that's another CIP request. Next slide. Um, still on Mauna Kea, we're about to finish the 90,000 acre fence that would entirely circle the mountain and protect the Palila critical habitat um, from goats and sheep. We need, and the final installment um, is re being requested of CIP to, um, to support that, which is a court ordered um, requirement to protect this critical habitat. And we're really hoping to be able to finish that. Um, another really interesting um, new technology we're working on is that mos um, sterile mosquito. I don't have enough time to talk about it here, but we're asking for um, a sector renovation project on Oahu. Next slide. Um, we're also trying to keep invasive predators from our snail populations. We have about 100 species of snails that are going to die in less than a decade, or sorry, go extinct in less than a decade um, because of these predators. And we, what we can do to save them is make these small predator proof fences. So we're really trying to, um, to, to stop that as well. Um, by protecting these areas. And so there's an a interactive map you can see of our, all of our DLNR CIP requests. And that's it. Aloha. Aloha, thank you for giving me some time today. Um, I'm with the Department of Land and Natural Resources Division of Aquatic Resources, Aquatic Invasive Species Team. Next slide. So Hawaii's aquatic resources are extremely valuable to our island. It's estimated that $1.2 billion a year is generated from tourism associated with those aquatic environments, $13.3 million a year um, for nearshore fisheries. And also it provides, our reefs provide $835 million a year in protection, coastal protection of building values. Because we're so um, I, geographically isolated, we have a high rate of endemism and unique environments that are highly susceptible to invasive species. Next slide. Um, so an aquatic invasive species is basically a non-native aquatic species that if introduced into an ecosystem, it causes harm to Hawaii's economy, environment, human health, or public safety and welfare. There's about 550 total introduced aquatic species that we know of in Hawaii, um, and that's likely an underestimate. Next. So the major vectors of aquatic invasive species include ballast water, biofouling, intentional or unintentional release, usually associated with aquarium or aquaculture hobbies, and marine debris. Um, so ballast water and biofouling are just um, the water that ships use to keep proper balance, as well as the organisms that grow on the bottom of a ship. Next. So when we're thinking about prevention, we really want to prevent the, the major vectors bringing more invasive species. So we currently manage ballast water. Um, we process about 800 ballast water reporting forms a year. And we also have a risk matrix to select ships to inspect. Um, the Vessel Incidental Discharge Act um, is going to be enacted. And so the Division of Aquatic Resources has worked on achieving the mandates that the Vessel Incidental Discharge Act um, will have. So we've collaborated with CGAPS in meeting and providing comments to the EPA and the US Coast Guard during the development of new federal regulations under VITA. Um, VITA, unfortunately, will preempt states from regulating ballast water and biofouling more stringently than VITA dictates. And it allows the states to enforce and co-enforce the new federal regulations but it does prohibit the states from charging shipping companies a fee to support this regulatory work. 
So that avenue um, of revenue is excluded as VITA stands currently. Next. So since 2020, we have rapidly responded to four high-risk introductions. Uh, there was a heavily fouled dry dock that the company did clean, um, but we went to inspect it and did find invasive species on it. We removed them. We also removed corals found in Kanihue Bay on Oahu and the North Shore of Hawaii uh, that were likely illegally outplanted and a corala marth in the Alawai. Next. So we continued our invasive algae management as well this year. We've outplanted over 850,000 urchins and we treat 235 acres in Kanyohe Bay and have expanded to treat 30 acres in the Waikiki MLCD. So the original um, management that occurred in Kanyohe Bay was mechanical removal. And then we outplant urchin, urchins that can graze the invasive algae to keep the reef healthy and allow it to grow. Next. So we have had some challenges. Uh, the revenue dictated by VITA um, is gonna be a challenge coming up when we are looking to co-enforce. And we've also had three unfunded civil service positions for the past two years. So we've been running on a civil service team of four funded positions out of seven, so about 60% for the last two years. Next. So our priorities for 2022 are to work to enact new regulations under VITA, prioritize prevention and response to species of concern and pathways that are high risk, continue the invasive algae management with native urchin biocontrol and expand the DAR AIS program capacity and reach. And so funding those positions would really help us with that. Um, if you would like to contact me, here's my email. I've also listed the email of Elizabeth Monahan, who's the ballast water and biofiling coordinator. And we also have a general AIS email. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you, Kim and Emma. We'll next hear from um, Mike Melzer and Mark Wright with the University of Hawaii. Hi. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to give this pres uh, presentation. My name is Mike Melzer, along with my colleague, Mark Wright, who, who, who's available for questions as well. Uh, we're with the College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, specifically, we're in the Department of Plant and Environmental Protection Sciences, which is uh, the main focus of this department is invasive species uh, work. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, invasive species, as, as we're aware, it, it continues to be a threat to our agriculture, economy, environment, and our, our the well-being of ourselves. Um, and this remains in a, a, a management and, and uh, control of invasive species is a priority for CTAR uh, through our mission, which includes both teaching, research, or uh, teaching, research, and extension. Um, we also are involved uh, on, on national networks as well. Um, so it's not just CTAR as well. We, we uh, exploit resources from, uh, like I said, national networks such as the National Plant Diagnostic Network and the National Plant Clean Plant Network uh, that were mentioned uh, earlier by Dr. Rog at HDOA. And these help provide tools uh, for us to combat invasive species in Hawaii, particularly those of agricultural focus. Uh, next slide, please. Um, from the administrative side of things, uh, well, the, you know, there's, there, it, there's no secret there's been a net loss in research on this uh, topic in CTAR, um, mostly due to retirement and, and other faculty who have, have left the college. Um, however, invasive species research and education extension, uh, it still remains an essential area for UH. Uh, so we're working on hiring requests within CTAR, and those are going to be uh, guided by the strategic planning that the college is currently undergoing, and then based on what the economic reality is for both the college and the university uh, in the coming years. Uh, next slide. Uh, so we, we often break down invasive species by activities that happen before the border, before they get here. Um, and some examples of those in, in recent years, we all remember, wow, it's been almost uh, 20 years now since Erythrina gall wasp uh, showed up and basically decimated all our willy willy trees. And, you know, it, it was some of this pre, uh, you know, foreign exploration that found a, a successful biocontrol agent. Um, other activities that we're doing, a lot of tropical crops are understudied. We don't know the pests and diseases that uh, Im uh, impact them. So we've been traveling a lot uh, doing exploration in other countries to identify some of the, the pests and pathogens that threaten our crops. Here we're looking at 
probably the classic example of the Alamai Babone disease of taro. These are taro plants um, from Papua New Guinea. And uh, we don't even know what the, the pathogen that's responsible. We're working to identify those pathogens so we can uh, develop diagnostics for, for their detection and exclusion from Hawaii. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we're also working at things that happen at the border. That's the next step, the, the, the next line of defense. Um, a project we have going on that's that's funded by CGAPS, a coordinating group on alien pest species through, through their uh, a proposal is we're working on diagnostics, basically utilizing new technologies and getting those to the front lines for our inspectors. Um, we have we have great inspectors at the ports of entry. Uh, some of these tools are really going to augment what they can do and, and uh, expand the list of pests and pathogens that they can rapidly identify instead of having to submit samples, you know, to a lab or so forth, they can do the work there. So we, we really need to take advantage of some of the new technologies that are emerging. Um, other activities include, you know, developing uh, and screening um, biocontrol agents under appropriate quarantine. Here's an example of the coffee berry borer parasitoid um, parasitizing uh, a coffee berry borer adult. Uh, next slide. And then we have a lot of, uh, you know, we're obviously we're not a research organization, uh, we're not a, a, a regulatory organization. So a lot of our activities is, is post-entry or post-border activities. Um, an example of that, that again, Dr. Rog uh, alluded to were the surveys. So, so we, uh, as the college, we do a lot of cooperative agricultural pest surveys or CAP surveys. And these are for exotic pests and pathogens that are both interest to USDA, the, the, the federal government, as well as here in Hawaii. And you know, here's just an example of some of the crops that we are routinely looking for exotic pests and pathogens for uh, in case we detect them. And if we detect them early, we can do a, a, a rapid response and, and hopefully lead to eradication. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also have activities on two important pests. Uh, um, uh, we've got Remy moth on mamaki and two line spittle bugs. So we need basically basic research on some of these invasive species that are threatening. And then once we have that basic research, uh, you know, that's where we can develop new tools and, and strategies for eradication uh, with the ultimate goal of long-term management. And that's the case if eradication is no longer uh, an option. Uh, next slide. Um, most of it, it always sounds bad, but there, there actually is some, you know, it's hard to document some of the success stories with invasive species work, but, but a few that we could come up with. Um, one that I, I, I find uh, particularly valuable just because I'm biased and I work with citrus, but we remain a free of citrus greening, uh, also known as Huang Long Bing. This is a disease that's impacting Florida severely. Um, basically every state, every citrus producing state in the US except us in Arizona have this disease. Um, and Arizona will probably have it soon. Uh, this is really going to be uh, basically boost Hawaii's prominence in terms of citrus industry and, and so forth in, in the U.S. for, you know, citrus is an important crop and being remaining free of this disease uh, is critical to expand our citrus, uh, uh, the importance of citrus in Hawaii. Um, we've heard a little bit about coconut rhinoceros beetle. Um, this is a collaborative effort uh, uh, between um, HDOA, USDA, and, and here in CITAR. Um, it's been a little over eight years since it was first detected. And, and basically, you know, the range has only minimally expanded since its introduction, where it's basically uh, only gone a few miles from the original detection point. Um, unlike in a lot of other places where it spread rapidly as soon as it was is detected. Um, we've been completing, or we have completed quarantine work and are starting to apply for permits for a, a coffee berry borer biocontrol agent. Um, there's some uh, development of management tools for two-line spittle bug. Uh, this this uh, uh, has so far been restricted to the Kona area, but you know it it poses an important uh, a major threat uh, to pasture lands uh, across the state, and uh, uh, also uh, involved in the um, uh, the planning for a new quarantine research facility, uh, which is desperately needed on Oahu and the Big Island. Uh, and I think that's actually our last slide. Uh, next slide. Yep, that's, that's the last one. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, next, we'll hear from Christy Martin, uh, who's with the coordinating group on alien pest species, and also Lori Buchanan, who's with the Molokai um, Invasive Species Committee. 
Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate this opportunity and I appreciate all of the previous speakers. Um, there's a lot of amazing work going on by very dedicated people. So I just wanted to take this time to share a little bit about, um, well, I guess our perspectives. Next slide. So you may be asking by now, well, who is CGAPS? You know, we heard about HISC. Uh, well, CGAPS is a, a partnership that includes not just the state agencies, but also the federal agencies uh, that work on invasive species, as well as the non-governmental organizations. Uh, we're all working together to protect Hawaii. Many of the people that participate in CGAPS and the steering committee, you've just heard from. We were formed in 1995 to try to identify and close the gaps in Hawaii's biosecurity programs. And I'm happy to say that you know, CGAPs and HISC networks um, bring different skills and abilities, different capacities to the table. And our strategy is uh, a joint strategy and it is focused on the highest priorities remaining in the interagency biosecurity plan. We have the same vision too. It's to protect all of the things that we love and care about in Hawaii uh, from the impacts of invasive species. Next slide. So where we see some strategic investments, you should have uh, identified and seen some of the work that you folks funded. Um, first of all, I mean, Dr. Rog was on point. Uh, the e-manifest work is able to go forward because of their new uh, Kupono database. Um, it allows Department of Ag to work smarter and to prioritize and identify where there's risk. And so continued investment in that area is really important, as well as inspection facilities. Uh, we haven't talked much about that today, but that remains a priority. We would love to see more general funds go to Department of Agriculture for the inspection of domestic cargo and high-risk inter-island cargo. You heard Two-line spittle bugs on one island, not the others. Coconut rhinoceros beetles on one island, not the others. Um, we need to really start digging in and figuring out what we can do about those things. Providing general and CIP funds so that you know we can, we all can <laughs> uh, fulfill our mission. Um, for example, Department of Ag talked a bit about biocontrol. Uh, new biocontrol facilities will help us address some of those pests that have gotten past those defenses and still cause tremendous harm. And of course, we need to manage forests for the future, funding the fencing and restoration work that has to happen. Um, that helps not just mitigate, mitigate against the invasive itself, but it helps us uh, in our plan to mitigate climate change impacts. Next slide. Um, we need to support DAR in their work. Uh, the vectors of ballast water and biofouling are truly challenging, and currently we have 1.5 person to manage that pathway. Um, it would also be great, you know, and 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 Rep Lowen, you've uh, spearheaded this work a bit in the past, but invasive species emergency response funds are important, and it's become actually a national priority. Uh, DOI is looking at how they might be able to um, work on something like this. Well, I think a state revolving fund might be uh, in order as well. And obviously there's a lot of groups outside of the agencies um, that work in, in everyone's communities, uh, like the Invasive Species Committees, Hawaii Ant Lab, uh, the Port Monitoring Surveillance Program called Mamalu Poi Poi, um, and all of these groups, including those at University of Hawaii. Uh, many of them, including CGAPS, full disclaimer, um, we receive funds from HISC. Um, not all of the funds come from HISC, but some supporting funds do. And so additional funds, not just to his, but also to the agencies that do the work um, is, is our message today. Um, the HISC really is a lot about gap filling. Uh, what, the, uh, what Chelsea showed in the beginning, that graph about the amount that HISC is um, receiving and how much requests they have, that's outside of the agency requests. It would be truly staggering if we put that graph together with what the agencies actually need. Next slide, please. And, oops, sorry, you can actually go to the previous slide. I, I left a space holder so that I can make sure and leave time for my colleague, um, Lori Buchanan, who comes to us from Molokai, and I just wanna hand that over to her. Um, aloha from Molokai, esteemed members. Mahalo Christy Martin for giving me a chance to see and talk to our legislators. Uh, you know, I miss and love you guys. 
Um, so with my one minute of opportunity, I wanted to say thank you. Um, committee chairs, Senator Gabbard, Senator Inouye, Representative Lowen, Representative Hashem, and Representative Tarnas, you're here. Um, you're here listening. And on behalf of myself, my colleagues, and our people across our pipeline, um, we want to convey our deep, sincere, and heartfelt gratitude to all of you here today uh, for sacrificing your lives and time to be public servants because protecting all that we love here in Hawaii is not easy. It's really, really hard. And so we promise to continue to work together to protect Hawaii from invasive species. And as you've seen by the many needs in our presentations today, we need help. Uh, we need help. Um, please help us. Uh, please help us to do what needs to be done to protect Hawaii um, as you've been doing all along. It's so very, very um, appreciated the time you guys take, especially today, to listen to us. Mahalo. Yeah, thank you so much, Lori and Christy and the rest of our presenters today and to all of you senators and representatives, again, just echoing what Lori stated. We just appreciate you all so much taking the time out to, for this briefing, but your continued support for invasive species um, work and management that we're all doing. I did have to skip over one presentation um, about ports of entry biosecurity. Um, there are appropriations bills currently to support that program. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions after or send more information about that program, but I wanted to leave some time um, to all of you to ask questions. So with that, I'll pass it back over to Chair Gabbard. Mahalo, Chelsea. Uh, okay, so q and uh, I'll start it off. Uh, actually, a question for Chelsea. Um, Chelsea, HISC receives $5.75 million every year from the ledge. What is that funding supporting? And is it is it really meeting the, uh, your current needs? Yeah, Christy touched on this in my graph earlier showed we do get 5.75 million the last uh, three or four years. And this is a huge contribution to supporting invasive species work that supports research. Some of the research that uh, Mike Melzer from University of Hawaii mentioned with two line spittle bug and trying to find new tools and technologies to address invasive species through prevention and management. Um, it supports the Island Invasive Species Committee, the Hawaii Ant Lab, coordinating group on alien pest species, also, you know, communications and outreach. I mean, there's so many projects and programs this funding supports, but of course, we're never able to give full the full amount that these programs request. We always are short and we always have to prioritize and not fund certain projects um, during those years. So that really kind of cuts into research, especially um, and, and supporting those programs that are developing new, new tools and technologies that could really help us manage invasive species. Thank you, Chelsea. Uh, Rep Lowen, you have to leave at two o'clock. So why don't you go next? Thank you, um, I appreciate it. I have um, a number of questions I'll follow up with offline since I, I don't have much time, but. I guess the primary one is um, the the hoofed. I mean, we we have the bill to uh, help um, control populations of hoofed animals, um, and I'm just curious. I mean, I know that eradication is a long way out, right? The idea of getting rid of all the hoofed animals. And we know that it would be good for forests, but in the meantime, we need them for fire fire fuel control, and you know, they're part of the hunting culture locally, et cetera, et cetera. But if there was a long-term goal or recognition in state law that uh, that the ultimate goal would be to get, have these animals out of our ecosystem so that we could not only protect the forests that still remain, but be able to allow some other areas to have forests bounce back, which is virtually impossible as long as goats and sheep are overrunning them. I mean, how would it change your policies of what you do today? And because, you know, year after year we pour millions of dollars into fencing projects 
that primarily are because we have these animals here. And, and the need for that funding, I mean, it's gonna be continuous to repair and maintain. Um, I know the expense for eradication would be large and it would not be without controversy, but on a policy level, what makes the most sense? Yeah, Mahalo Rep Lowen for that question. And I just wanna mention that we do have other uh, support here to answer those questions. So we have Deputy DLNR Deputy Bob Masuda, um, the DOFA Administrator David Smith, um, and also Emma Yoon, who you heard from. So I'll pass that over to one of them. Yeah, good afternoon. This is uh, David Smith. I'm Administrator with the Division of Forestry and Wildlife. Thank you, Rep Lauren, for that question. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of complicated. I mean, the animals are widespread. There certainly is the technology to go after them more aggressively. And we have seen, you know, we're seeing, uh, you know, widespread issues um, right now, specifically with Maui Nui with excess deer. Um, but the, uh, you're right, the ongoing cost of managing these animals is huge, not just for native ecosystems, but for agriculture, uh, and we're starting to see health and safety issues with animals, you know, on the highways, whether it be goats in Kona or uh, deer on Maui. And so, um, you know, it, uh, there are certainly uh, costs associated with feral animals. Uh, that said, you know, th there is, um, there are ways to balance, uh, you know, the um, protection of the environment with uh, having uh, hunting opportunities. And, and if you were to move toward more of a situation where uh, you were trying to eradicate the animals uh, for, you know, cost benefit, uh, did a cost benefit analysis and decided that getting rid of animals was uh, the way to go, um, you know, hunting is still going to be a, a piece of that um, for in the long term. And, and you know, these animals are uh, also in a lot of areas that um, where hunters can have access uh, that don't have the heavy environmental costs. So you, lowlands, uh, gulches, areas around residential areas, you know, there's all those sorts of things. There are uh, technologies, including toxicants that you could use to go after some of these animals. But I think hunting is always gonna be an important part of the mix. Um, fencing is gonna always be an important part of the mix. But from the very beginning, forestry in Hawaii was based on protecting uh, our watersheds from feral animals, and uh, and and there's been concern, you know, since the 30s. Uh, one of our first foresters, um, uh, Judd, was uh, very concerned about the ingress of you know, feral animals into the forest. Built a lot of the trails to get hunters in there to help control animals. So this is not a new situation, and um, for, it would be a policy, you know, call whether we were to go after animals, but that's certainly uh, one option is, is to try to reduce the animals um, in a more widespread fashion. I, I, won't, I won't go on because I do have to run, but I guess that partly answered my question, but not entirely, because the question is kind of if hypothetically there was a policy that, of course, not in the near term, because it wouldn't be possible. There would continue to be opportunities for hunters for many, many years, yep. and their partners in, in doing this work. But, but um, if there was a long-term policy, how would it change the approach today? And, and like, what would the cost benefit be over the long term, I guess? But you don't have to answer it right now. I do have to run. So I really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, uh, okay. for your really informative presentations. OK, thank you. Hi everyone, um, Senator Gabbard's computer shut down, uh, but he's trying to get back on. But Senator Inouye, you, know, you can go ahead with your question. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think I need to have Dr. Rogue um, from HDOA. Um, and the question, um, the question is uh, incoming nursery plants and trees. And, um, you know, there's in the industry, um, there's new varieties, as we all know, uh, when uh, nursery owners travel throughout the country, particularly in, in the Asian countries, Africa, bringing in new varieties such as the bamboo. Um, and I'm just wondering if um, we already have a permitting system um, that we do whenever a farmer or 
a nursery person wants to bring in a new variety of a crop. Then let me say one thing um, regarding, um, I, I guess, not having oversight of um, too many of the, the incoming plants. Um, I may be wrong, but this new variety of bamboo seems very popular in landscaping. And let me share with you what the damage is being done throughout Big Island in particular. And I, our residents in Pauka, we're only three miles out of downtown Hilo. And we had a new uh, person buy our, come in and buy the home next to us. And in the landscaping uh, part of his property, he brought in from Pune um, bamboo. And it's very interesting because our lots are only 12,000 square feet. And so he surrounded the entire property um, because he wanted privacy and planted um, the bamboos and he brought in the fire ants. And so, um, you know, it's now we're, we're trying to control our own residents, but feel sorry for our neighbors down the street and the entire Pauka Papaiko area as well. So I'm just wondering if um, we do have, uh, if we have a record or know who's ordering uh, a plant, plants and trees from other areas and how, and it, just tell us what kind of system we have other than your inspection at the, at the piers at, and um, the airports. Thank you, Senator, for your question. And I have also my colleague here is the compliance chief, Jonathan Ho, on there to give you the specifics about the, the bamboo. But in general terms, there's a separation of jurisdiction. Everything that comes in from overseas is on the federal jurisdiction. So our a regulatory system agency, USDA, APHIS, PPQ, has the authority. And so our um, CBB, custom, sorry for all the acronyms, our Custom Border Protection Act specialists are reviewing everything that comes on, comes into the state from overseas. We as the as state agency, we have the uh, jurisdiction and the authority over interstate shipment. So I'll let Jonathan talk about specifically the, uh, the bamboo, because I know when I worked for 17 years in, in Oregon, in the same position, we had actually bamboo on our um, noxious sweet list, some species, because they are invasive, um, and we have restriction in sale in nurseries. So Jonathan can tell you probably the more details. Jonathan, go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Good afternoon, chairs, uh, members of the committee. Um, Jonathan Ho, uh, Inspection Compliance Section Chief for the Plant Quarantine Branch. Uh, so for uh, bamboo specifically, uh, for state regulations, um, all gra all plants in the family Poaceae, so which would include bamboo, um, require a one-year quarantine for importation. And... Um, um, so the, sorry, the importation requires one year quarantine. However, um, interstate movement or transport after it classes quarantine, there is no restriction uh, per, except for the fact that um, inter-island movement of the plants would require an inspection. Um, regarding the actual, um, uh, I think you had mentioned specifically record keeping, of every individual plant and um, um, uh, whether it be importation or transportation, um, we don't keep um, specific records from that standpoint uh, uh, unless the plant itself is specifically um, uh, has, has additional restrictions outside of inspection requirements. The requirements so anything on the international side um, bringing in uh, is, um, I guess, overseen by the feds? Yes, we are. Do uh, they need an application process or what does the fed do and do they then send the information back to uh, our state? Um, yeah, so we, uh, for foreign importation, we are actually preempted uh, through the Plant Protection Act. So um, yeah, we're not getting um, some of the things. Um, um, we do work collaborative, co collaboratively with um, Customs and USDA uh, for certain projects, particularly with um, fruit and veg. Um, 
but um uh, but yeah a lot of times the, again the preemption issue does kind of um keep us from getting getting okay. to things thanks i i don't want to be, uh, belabor my questions but i have several but i think one more important i need to ask and i think it's with dlnr and with kim um regarding vita um the question is um is she still on Yes. Um, yep. Oh, okay. All right. Um, th thanks for um, our uh, actually getting involved with what Vida is all about. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that um, the Vessel um, Incidental Discharge Act, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because um, one question that I had, um, would Vida, okay, so is the act already in place or is being worked on? I believe it's still being worked on, but we actually have our legal fellow, Andrew Porter on, um, so he could probably answer the more technical aspects of that. Okay, and the reason I'm asking is that, um, and probably CGAP would probably be interested in this as well, is um, I, I thought I remember seeing something on the slide that said something under state control. So, um, and a reason I'm asking is that if there's going to be uh, any penalties um, from the illegal discharging, that if we're, we can be in control of any penalties, but I was just wondering that it would be a good time uh, if it's this in discussions right now, that there be a penalty as well, and that the penalty uh, for the illegal discharge should come to us, to DLNR. And that would probably help um, administer some of the funding source, you know, for the agency. So, um, but can we uh, later on? Uh, why don't you we get into a briefing? Because I'm I'm really interested because I'm you know I'm on um, the NCSL um, uh, uh, committees that will probably um, would try to get some help from our National Association of of legislators and, and um, overseeing uh, where we are and what we can also be part of asking that a penalty uh, be, um, you know, be made and funding gets to, to our programs in Hawaii. So let, let's get together later and keep me posted. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. Any questions from the house chairs? Uh, yes, chair, perhaps I can uh, go ahead if that's all right sure. with you. Yes. Thank you. I just wanna express my appreciation uh, to all the presenters. Uh, this is very important work, very difficult work. <clears throat> and uh, I know there's a, a lot of asks that are in for funding and we really need to do what we can to support those asks within our own uh, money committees. Um, it is, uh, there's a lot of competition for the funds as we rework the administration budget. Um, I appreciate your advocacy uh, for those uh, requests. Um, at the same time, I also urge you to, you know, look uh, any opportunities as you already are, you know, for federal funds, uh, the uh, bipartisan infrastructure uh, law, um, you know, may be a source of some uh, opportunity. Um, we certainly have emphasized the need to make our ports and highways uh, and court transit corridors, you know, more resilient to effects of climate change. And there's ways, you know, I'm sure you're very creative in figuring out how we might be able to provide something that could help us uh, in some of these invasive species issues when it comes to infrastructure projects. So um, no questions, uh, Chair Gabbard. I just want to express my appreciation. I know our timing uh, may want to move along, but I just want to express my appreciation and, and that we're in this together. We'll see what we can do, come up with state funds, Let's see what we can get federal funds as well. And uh, along with, with uh, the other um, chairs here, we do work at the federal level to advocate. And so keep us in the loop, uh, as Chair Inouye said, so that we can help advocate uh, for any things that you're going after in terms of federal support. So thanks very much and back to you. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Okay, folks, uh, we are out of time. So I would just like to say uh, aloha and mahalo, everyone for participating in today's uh, info briefing and to the presenters for sharing all that excellent information. I believe that, you know, it's essential that we 
we maintain and support these agencies and organizations that are critical to the prevention and management of invasive species. So keep up the great work you're doing. Mahalo and, and have a wonderful weekend. Aloha and mahalo.